I'm going to talk about the effects of our changing climate on historic structures. And that's worded slightly carefully because these are not proven effects, but, but observed effects and trends that we've noticed or that we've noticed that we know through project work or, or through the press. So I'm going to start by talking about how climate change is affecting our historic structures. And that's taking some general cases and, and some examples. And then I'm going to use a case study in a little bit more depth, uh, which is the collapse of the curtain wall to Lewis Castle. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the history and evolution of the castle and, and what happened um, and the sort of process that we went through along with the rest of the team and our understanding of the collapse and how that relates potentially to climate change. And then I'm going to talk very briefly about what we as engineers can do about it. Environmental impacts range from um, weather events such as rainfall, heavy, um, heavy and more intense um, bursts of rainfall, flooding, sea levels, and, and the imp impact that has also on our soils, so wetting and drying in terms of shrinkage of clay soils and subsidence. Um, it has impacts in terms of heat waves, greater thermal changes and fire, um, stronger winds and more frequent storms. Um, increased carbon dioxide and the effect in particular that has on our concrete structures and changes in distribution of insects and pests, um, something that we might not quite have on our radar yet, um, but is something to be mindful of. And something we've noticed is that these, these environmental impacts are not um, causing problems in isolation to historic structures. They tend to be coupled with human intervention or or lack of human intervention, lack of maintenance. Um, and perhaps, you know, we've, in the last couple of years with COVID, we've seen a, a, an increased occurrence of, of, of issues and events relating to that. Um, it's coupled with inappropriate materials for repair, a lack of understanding of traditional building materials and inappropriate application of, of modern um, methods to historic buildings. And also ill, Ill ill-conceived alterations or, or poor quality workmanship. So when something has fundamentally changed through um, through a lack of understanding or a lack of care. So taking the first one, obviously the, the sort of direct impact we can see of flooding is, is the impact on our historic um, sites and towns and cities. We also see that at a more local level to our buildings. This building here is um, a priory house in Dunstable, a 13th century undercroft over, you know, surrounded by an 18th century um, envelope. And this is not a river outside the building. This is just simply um, what has happened over the recent years in heavy rain event. So we see there the water flowing into past down the high street, down the hard standings, the heavy pavement, pavements, the, the raised levels and flowing into the Priory Gardens, which were a scheduled monument. Um, these photos were taken a few years ago, but I was sent some more just two days ago on Tuesday, which looked exactly the same. Unfortunately, we're seeing these problems continue. This is the crypt of a, of a cathedral in Kent, recently um, restored and looking absolutely wonderful. The week after that happened, a heavy rainstorm deluge onto the pavements and a flow of water into the building. Um, again, you know, mitigation measures uh, needed to be put in place. So this was addressed with, with stormwater attenuation. We've also seen indirect um, consequences of heavy bursts of rain which relate to capacity of rainwater goods and drains and um, our historic buildings were never never designed never considered the the weather events that we see today so this at, at um, Canterbury Cathedral um, movement was noted on the flying buttresses at the South Isle and failure in the stonework of the window 
the south um, of the cathedral runs a large drain, a large historic drain, and it was noted that that was failing. It was failing through through um, through its age and, and water seeping out, but also the sheer volume of water coming down from the cathedral roofs and the hard standings into the historic drains. Um, we've seen landslips. This is a, a, a castle um, wall, a castle embankment, again dating from, from the 11th century, stood there for this time. And then in the, the 21st century, we've seen a recurrence of um, landslips and, and problems along along the bank. Um, again, that's been coupled with uh, nibbling into the base of the embankment for, for houses and gardens. And that's required a major pro, um, programme of, of stabilisation. We've seen medieval city walls collapse. Um, this again is within the last year. It's a, a 13th, 14th century wall um, with a, a historic soft rubble core that's been refaced later time in the 20th um, century perhaps uh, um, with with a hard cement mortar and over time the rains got in and caused this collapse and it was raining very heavily the day of the collapse. We've seen that on our castle walls as well. We've seen flooding and um, you know our our um, the Thames Barrier here um, recently um, it has been opening and, and closing far more than it was ever designed, and the capacity of the barrier will be, you know, superseded, and additional strategies need to be put in place um, within the next few decades. We've seen shrinkage of clay soils. This is a church in Essex and um, the movement has been occurring just over the last um, you know, few, few years. And if you know, you say you can get a, a, a crack is structural if you could get your hand in it. Well, I could pretty much get my arm in this one. Another example and a similar concern and reports from the um, British Geological Survey show that in the next 50 years, over 10% of UK buildings will be affected by subsidence. And of course, those are in areas where there are heavy clay subsoils. We've seen heat waves, greater thermal changes and fire risks. And this, just a caveat, is um, a, a church we've been working on that was not a result of fire from climate change, just, just to illustrate a point. And we've seen strong winds. This is the same poor church that was then, after repair, being repaired from its fire, suffered damage in Storm Eunice. This took down the flagpole. We've seen other effects from Storm Eunice to take knock down um, or knock over um, historic stonework at the top of the cathedral roof. And we saw damage, direct damage from Storm Eunice from one of our projects where we had scaffolding over the top of the cathedral and. Uh, Unfortunately, it punched a few new roof lights into the, the, the lead of the roof that we were not um, not wanting. But we were delighted it didn't actually take off entirely. These are all, you know, events that um, the winds were, were perhaps not within the, the capacity or the considered um, expected um, life with, within the, the design of the scaffold or, or um, you know, with, within the building. We've seen damage to roof coverings as well, where, where we've had very strong winds ripping over the cathedral, over the church roofs. And um, here's just a, an example, not one that we at the Morton Partnership have worked on, but uh, a church in Somerset that was also a victim of Storm Eunice. Some of you may have seen this in the press. And um, let's see if we can get the video to play. Some pretty catastrophic and uh, spectacular examples of failure. 
and here it is being being rebuilt. We've also um, seen or the, the potential for changes in distribution of insects and pests. And there was a termite um, outbreak in part of the, the southwest. Um, we hadn't seen termites in, in Britain before. They were transported in um, accidentally and within some, some packaging, as I understand it. And, um, you know, the, the, the impacts that termites have on, on timber is devastating and hopefully not something that we will see, but with, with increasing temperatures, our timber becomes increasingly vulnerable. I'm going to talk now a little bit more about the collapse of Lewis Castle Curtain Wall as a case study. Um, I'm presenting um, on behalf of the work that the Morton Partnership carried out as, as conservation structural engineers, but a lot of my work um, slides and images are also taken from the project archaeologist, HP Archaeology and Conservation. So this is Lewis Castle. It is a, a, a originally a, a Norman castle built first in the 11th century, added to and chopped and changed over the years with the addition of the later Barbican in the 14th century that we can see here. And this view is taken from the keep. It's very unusual. It's one of only two Mott and Bailey castles in the country with two mots or mounds. Uh, the other being Lincoln. And this is um, the, the focus of the case study is actually on the curtain wall we see to the south. So for those of you who don't know where Lewis is, it's on the south coast of uh, the UK in East Sussex. And post-conquest Sussex was divided into these areas of land called rapes and Lewis Castle um, was the acted as the defences for the rape of Lewis. It was built by William de Warren in um, at the end of uh, very soon after the, the Norman conquest in about 1068, um, starting with the, uh, the the embankments and then later the curtain walls coming up soon after. The wall I'm going to talk about is part of the curtain wall, which is we don't know the date exactly, but late 11th century, so round about um, you know, 10, 10, between 1068 and 1088. Um, I didn't do my calculations, but uh, yeah, of, of significant age. Um, it stood about eight metres tall and about two and a half metres wide. It's deceptively large um, from what the pictures show. But, you know, you've got some trees for context. Um, this is on the left how it stood in in 2016 and you can see it's a patchwork of interventions and repairs that have taken place. It was maintained by um, by the, the the county council and after that in in 2017 where they took off vegetation they repaired in lime mortar all under consent and all, all documented and agreed with historic England. But then on the um, 19th of November uh, 2019, there was a catastrophic collapse. Um, and this is, this is how the wall looks, looked. Um, this happened overnight and there was a major search and rescue effort that took place um, to search for people. Um, the wall was built on the top of the embankment and houses that sit cut within the embankment lower down um, or you can see we're, we're impacted by the collapse. Fortunately, um, the room at the top there that you can see um, that's been hit uh, was unoccupied at the time and nobody was hurt, which is which was the, 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 the best news that could be had. The wall itself, as you can see, is in the grounds of a private garden, but within the ownership of a council and it is completely landlocked, which had a great bearing on how we approached the investigations and the repairs of the wall. So this is what it looks like on collapse. And one of the th first things we did was to ascend site and have a look at, at what we could see. 
Um, we again, um, we were not part of the team appointed to to deal with the the repair of the building that it hit, but obviously close liaison was needed with with the owners of that building and uh, and also the owners of of the um, garden in which the monument sits. Initial clearance was carried out to stabilise unsafe masonry and pre prevent any further collapse. This was all done under the watching eyes of the project archaeologist um, Dick and Hart from HP Archaeology and Conservation. And we carried out some temporary consolidation just to hold in place just with some modern uh, materials just to prevent any further falls of, of loose masonry and some hessian. Um, while we worked out what on earth went wrong and what on earth we should do about it. So our role as conservation structural engineer is probably a little bit different to what many of those you on, online who are used to dealing with with new structures. Our role was one of firstly forensic investigation, so what we thought went wrong. And really importantly, when we look to repair a historic structure, we need to understand what has caused the problem so that we can address it. A bit like if you went to the doctors with a big cut on your leg, you wouldn't want them to just stick on a sticking plaster. You'd want to, or a big wound on your leg, you'd want them to work out what, what caused it and, and, and deal with that. So you need to treat the cause as well as the symptom, and it's the same with historic structures. So we, we had carried out an inspection on site. Uh, we, from that inspection of the debris, worked out how we thought the wall might have come down. Uh, we looked at things like not just the wall itself, but the ground, um, any signs of ground movement, any nearby drainage that might have collapsed or failed. And we looked at the condition of adjacent structures because the, the embankment on which this wall is built is also supported by a lower retaining wall. So from looking at the, the debris, what we could tell um, almost immediately was some of it had fallen in large chunks and they were large chunks bound with hard cement mortar. We could see signs of previous grouting, previous patches of brickwork, previous we could see signs of tree roots and or plant roots and um we could see uh signs of, of plant and yeah algal algal growth so all of this started to build up a bit of a picture of what had happened we undertook some investigations kept taking some cores uh, 100 millimeter diameter cores down from the head of the wall through to investigate what we thought was left, the, looking at the condition of the, the core of the wall and looking at the, the adjacent section of wall that hadn't collapsed and um, to see how worried we were about whether that was going to be a problem. We, um, what we found was, was very hard to interpret and that, that was just kind of one piece of the jigsaw puzzle that helped us um, to work out what was going on. We also, um, in conjunction with the project archaeologists, carried out a series of archaeological test pits, which were necessary for an archaeological understanding of the site, but also from our understanding as structural engineers of what the foundations of the wall are, their, their form, their condition, and onto which what they are founded. And what we found was um, really interesting actually it looks like a picture of a load of stripy mud and chalk um, that was all recorded and analysed and what the project archaeologist theory was is that the ditch next to the wall was excavated the chalk um, from the ground was chucked up to form the embankment and then perhaps over the next winter the ditch was was uh, the, the work ceased the townsfolk who was course were not happy with the their new um, Norman inhabitants chucked all their rubbish into the ditch and we found within those brown layers bits of pottery bits of um, organic materials and all sorts of things that that, that helped to um, accord with that understanding and, and to date those deposits and then we found another layer of chalk and then another layer of rubbish and and they were all at a diagonal showing the 
showing us the form of the original bankment as it as it was. Um, we also found, I mean, which rather stumped us at the other end of the wall, uh, what looked like underpinning. So we found some coarse brickwork. Uh, brickwork was of um, standard imperial bricks, which told us it was probably Victorian or, or later, and some coarse chalk um, under the wall as well, which gave us a clue that there'd been some problem or some intervention in the past. And rather, rather interestingly, looking back through um, what we knew about the, the garden, um, the owner of the property kindly provided us with some historic information about what the garden used to look like. And it used to be a, a, a sort of rather famous garden owned by, um, at, at the turn of the 18th, 19th century, by Frank, Frank Footmore, who um, used the garden as a, a, a kind of repository for a collection of stones and objects he'd found all over the world, which helped us to understand why we found some unusual stones and objects within the collapsed material. It also showed us that the garden was flat and not an embankment, so it helped to give us a clue why we thought there might be some underpinning there and, and that the, the historic levels had been lowered at some point. Um, this was all rec recorded in, in detail by, by the archaeologist and that gave us, him um, the ability to analyse the different periods of, of wall. And what we can see here is historic core. Um, and for those less familiar with um, this type of wall, the core is uh, rubble um, core, which is uh, loose bits of chalk in this instance and flint um, set in a lime mortar and just kind of chucked in and then it was later refaced. Um, most recently in the middle of the 20th century with flint and with cement mortars. Um, we also, or the, the archaeologists, carried out some test slots against the wall to, to record the deposits in the same way. And again, we could see they were all slumping down, which gave us a bit of a, a clue that the wall had had some problems in the past. Perhaps somewhat unusually, um, I also went to the National Archives and had a look through um, the, the records that were there, and we found tons of records. Um, we found letters from the, the council, the surveyor to the council, writing to the prime minister, complaining that something must be done about the condition of the wall in, in, the, mid, um, in, in the 1930s. And then again, lots of documentation from the 1950s as uh, stories of collapses to face work and patching it up. And we, could see, we found photos of it repaired in the 1950s where we believe just before that the adjacent section collapsed. So a history of, of events leading up to, to tell us a bit more about what we were seeing now. We also looked into the history and evolution of the castle to try to understand where we, we could date, date the walls. And so from the Sussex Archaeological Society records um, showed us, you know, that that, that the, the wall was, was fully in, in place by circa 1100, which gave us some, some information about what we, um, confirming what we had thought. And we also can compare that with, with what we see now, and we can see how much of the curtain wall has been lost over the course of time. Um, so that gave some archeological analysis over the key periods in which the events um, had affected the wall. Obviously, some huge gaps in, in knowledge, but all added to that picture. So then that led us, led us to suppose why we felt um, the collapse had occurred. So this is my um, somewhat cartoon sketch to illustrate a point and just a little person there for, for reference of the size. It, it is a big wall. It's just a wall. Um, and what we can see there is the lowering of the ground levels on the left hand side, um, exposing potentially the top of the foundation. And we can see, you know, the, the illustration um, of the, the flint facing tied into the core. Um, we can see at points in time, vegetation was allowed to grow rampant on the wall and its roots 
penetrated deep into the wall. And in the middle of the 20th century, it was refaced in cement. Over time, those, those vegetation was taken off the wall and repairs were, were made. But the roots died away, decayed away, leaving great fissures in the top of the wall. And over the time, you know, just, just allowing water into the core. The water, you know, obviously tried to, to escape from the wall, but it was, I think, the, the term used by Historic England, it was bound in a, a cementitious straitjacket. It couldn't get out. It was hemmed in by 300 millimetres of hard cement facing. So instead it went down and down and down until uh, it escaped at the base of the wall where it could and kept showing signs potentially of, of bulging. And some of the recent records um, noted concerns around around bulging around, around about the 2017 works. Um, that was probably leading to the, the face of the core detach the face of the wall detaching from the core and the core itself slumping and deteriorating in, in condition. Worth remembering that it's it's constructed from um, chalk set in lime mortar. So by the time water has a, a, attacked that for a number of years, it was actually very hard to to really interpret and, and find evidence of, of intact mortars at the base of the wall. Uh, but we did examine the adjacent standing sections, of course. Um, and that bulging eventually led to, um, you know, saturation under a very heavy rainstorm. We know that, that the night before um, the wall collapse was ex an extremely heavy um, rainfall in the area. Um, our super supposition was that the wall became saturated at the base and, and just finally those outer skins gave up and essentially leading to a bursting failure at the base catastrophic failure. Just for those who are less familiar perhaps with, with traditional buildings. So modern buildings work by keeping out the rain. Um, so we have, you know, a, a hard modern brick in a hard sand cement mortar. We have, uh, this is a, a, an illustration of rising damp, but the same for falling damp. You know, we have a damp proof course, a barrier to, to allow damp in. And, and the idea is that water is kept out Historic buildings, traditionally built, are not the same. They allow water in and they allow water out again. Water evaporates in equilibrium through the mortar joints. The mortar joints being in, in a lime mortar that is softer and sacrificial to the masonry in which it sits. So the problems that we have are when modern methods start to get combined with these historic walls and structures as well. So how does climate change affect rainfall intensity? Well, you know, as, as the, the temperature rises for every one degree centigrade more that the air warms, it can hold about 7% more water, according to the Met Office. And that leads to heavier bursts of rain and greater risks of flash flooding. And of course, we have lots of areas of hard standing and you know other, other changes to the landscape that, that just can't cope with these bursts of water. So what did we do about it? We, well, we needed to intervene. We have to ensure the structural integrity of the remaining wall. We have to conserve the wall, which is a scheduled monument, um, considering the impact on the remaining standing fabric, which, you know, I accept is a, a mere stump of what used to remain, but it, it, it is the remains of what used to be there and the impact on, on buried archeology span below ground. And of course, to provide a functional wall, it was the boundary wall between two properties that provided a, a visual and a physical barrier between them, providing privacy, providing security. And that's important as well. It's, it's all about not to just preserve a monument for, um, for the sake of it, but it, it forms part of the, the value and you know, the importance of, of the site and, and, and the world in which we live. Um, so from a structural point of view, um, stability of the existing wall was absolutely key. We looked at how to consolidate the collapsed northern face. We looked at how to improve the permeability of the standing south face, how to deal with the head of the wall, which is you know, two and a half metres. So it's, it's, it's some, some wall head. 
and the, the minimum foundations to the wall, the wall being built directly off the, the chalk deposits. We have to think about durability. How do we protect the wall at its head using a soft or a hard capping? And by that, a soft capping, I mean a grass vegetative capping that allows allows water um, again to, to percolate slowly or to, to evaporate away, or a hard capping, so uh, mortar and, and stone. And we also thought most importantly about access and maintenance, because there was absolutely no point in repairing this wall if nobody can get back to it from the council to repair it again. Um, so one of the things we needed to think about is that the wall is a, the wall and the ground on which it stands is a scheduled monument. That is the oldest and perhaps strictest form of our heritage protection. And it is uh, for nationally important archaeological sites. There are around about 20,000 scheduled monuments in England, and they're protected under the Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Areas Act in 1979, which basically means don't touch them without permission. Um, they are, well, guided for selection for scheduling by the principles set out by uh, the Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport, um, DCMS, and in reality administered by Historic England. Um, you know, again, anyone not familiar with, with historic buildings, each is listed on the National Heritage List for England. And if you go onto Historic England's website, you can find that and search by map or by name of the place you want to find. And that will give you a little bit more direction of a starting point. The wall was also grade two listed, uh, but that um, scheduling trumps the listing. So we needed to apply for scheduled monument consent. And that consent was needed for the initial investigative works and then another application for the repairs. The emergency clearance was done under a, a class five emergency consent. So we carried out an options appraisal, not just ourselves, but in conjunction with our client, the council, in conjunction with the, the landowner and with Historic England, with the archaeologist. So all sorts of, of, of parties. Um, one thing that the, the landowner immediately says, well, I want you to, to rebuild the wall as it was. Um, and that, we can see a logical argument for that. But that was after much discussion, discounted. It, full rebuild, I estimate maybe 500 tonnes of material was needed onto something that has no foundations and there is no access to get it there. So both the logistical constraints and the fact that we would have to excavate and remove the remains of the wall and the, the below ground archaeology that was there to build a new foundation meant that that was unacceptable for a number of reasons. So we looked at retaining the wall as a ruin at its current height and, and protecting it, but that didn't tick the, the boxes either. It didn't provide the privacy or the security that the, the landowners needed. We looked at putting a fence or planting or hedging in, but again, those options are not without damage to the monument and restrict access for maintenance. So we discounted those. And what we went with in the end was to rebuild part of the wall to a height that provided enough privacy with a legible intervention that you could read should you be you know, technically minded or um, interested enough to, to find out what happened. Um, and that very simply, the, 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 this, this bit was the easy bit, but getting to this bit was, was the challenge. This was very simply rebuilding part of the wall uh, to, to a height that we agreed to provide privacy, reinstating the gateway and consolidating what was there. We carried out a lot of, um, or put in a lot of effort to select materials properly. So on the north side, so on the south side of the wall, um, where there were bands of brick, these were matched in um, with suitable um, historic, well, handmade clay bricks. Uh, we, we carried out mortar testing to find out what um, existing mortars were there from, from the surrounding, um, walls primarily, and we could see lots of fragments of oyster shells, or shells anyway, um, and, and lots of large aggregates and things like that that we, we used to, to inform our repairs, and, and also, of course, looking visually. Um, 
we reused all of the collapsed material that wasn't bound in cement so that was carefully sorted through all of the worked stone so all of the um, ornamental carved stone that was recovered from the collapsed material was set aside and then all of the larger flints and uh, were, were, were um, reused and just using a very set simple technique using long flints to tie into the core of the wall every um, few courses so essentially using a, a physical tie trying to avoid the use of bits of stainless steel and metalwork as much as we could and here are the masons um, carrying out the work um, so the, the contractor for the project was Chisma, a local building contractor in East Sussex and the masons were T.E. Tillies and uh, both were absolutely fantastic on on the project and, and really um, engaged and, and helpful in in working out what on earth we needed to do. And this is the wall just gradually coming up to here. So here it is as it stands. Well, as it stood last year, and I will be going back uh, in a couple of weeks' time to see how it stands today and how it's it's um, fared over the, the last year. Um, so a, a shell of what it once was. Um, but we we thought that was the best, um, making the best of what 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 we could. So the wall itself, the material has been conserved. Um, it's able to um, provide a, a physical barrier, and, and the structure structural integrity has been restored. We also carried out um, again sort of low low intervention repairs to the the boundary walls that were affected by collapse. So here, this one was leaning, and we just simply added. A buttress in the style of the wall and this this is a bunk called bungaroosh which is a, a type of construction local to um parts of uh, sussex and and down in the south of england um and it basically um <laughs> means lumps of, of whatever you have to hand put in set into the wall and um, thrown in and set in a, a lime mortar and to do this we used all of the kind of leftover brick samples that weren't a suitable match all of the bits of collapsed rubble um, so, you know, from that point of view, we, we, we wasted very little. So that was telling you a little about, about what happened. What can we do about it? Well, I think we all have a, a duty to improve our understanding. Um, we're all obviously engaged in, um, you know, the ice structure is already heavily engaged in understanding climate change and, and what um, structural engineers can do to mitigate that. And in the context of, of the historic environment, that is for, I think we have a duty to improve our understanding, to record what we see, to, to record the patterns and the trends and the changes and, and to learn from that. We need to think about broader parameters for design, accounting for climate change. And of course, the codes go some way to, to helping us with that, but also a sort of sensible, pragmatic approach, taking a step back and looking at the bigger picture. Most importantly, as you'll see from most of the failure mechanisms, they involve water. So improving the, the building's ability to get rid of water, um, and, you know, proper repairs and maintenance of gutters, downpipes, stormwater attenuation, etc. And we can promote the need for regular inspection and maintenance. And part of this project, we, we delivered to the client an inspection and maintenance plan, which showed them what they needed to do and when. Um, taking a sort of quinquennial, so five-year inspection basis for, for most things and a, an annual or biannual maintenance basis for removal of vegetation. Um, and that, that's really key. So removing vegetation, clearing out, you know, not, not just in this example, gutters and drains and repairing the, the building envelope to deal with removal of water. We have a duty to use appropriate conservation-led um, materials and approaches, understanding the difference between traditional buildings and modern buildings. And if if we don't understand that, you know, the, the engaging a, an experienced conservation accredited professional to do that. And I think Jane has already shared with you the CARE register, the conservation accreditation register for engineers. I really encourage those of you who are, are interested and, and already have experience of, of historic structures to to think about applying and, and engaging with the register um this just this image just just for amusement is uh, the buddleia that we took out of the buddleia route that we took out of the wall with, with someone's legs for reference you know that was about the size of me and i think that probably dates 
this was the adjacent section um, when that section was last maintained. Um, I'll just end on a little quote. Um, this is um, from the SPAB manifesto by William Morris. The SPAB is a Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings. And the quote I will read, we plead and call upon those who have to deal with them to put protection the place in, pla in the place of restoration, to stave off daily uh, decay by daily care, to prop a perilous wall or mend a leaky roof by such means as are obviously meant for support or covering. And what that means to us, I think, as engineers is less is more. Obviously, you know, there's a, a a desire to intervene and to repair something, but often the best input we can have as an engineer is to say that it's something is okay. Um, also, though, rather interestingly, that in the SPAB manifesto is another part of the quote, which is resist all tampering with either the fabric or ornament of the building as it stands. If it has become inconvenient for its present use to raise another building rather than alter or enlarge the old one. And that's an interesting point in regards to sustainability and climate change as we think of it now. And I think perhaps that point is, is um, superseded by the impacts that we see of climate change. <laughs>